Welcome everybody to the Canada 2067 Vancouver Youth Summit. I'm John Woodward, I'm a journalist from CTV News and I will be your moderator today. And I understand we have some kids from Surrey here. Can I hear some kids from Surrey? Yeah, not bad, not bad. There's some people from North Vancouver. Uh, they're small but fierce. Uh, and some uh, students from Vancouver. Can I hear you guys as well? Yeah, the home team. I love it. Um, yeah, welcome to the Canada 2067 Summit. The, the logo, of course, is right up behind me on that five-story screen. Uh, I knew, I had been warned that I was going to be one of the smaller brains up here today on stage, but this is a bit ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> um, we got some people here who are kind of a big deal, though, and, and it's going to be a big day. People who are uh, really, really luminaries in their field, they're going to share some really cool stuff with you. So we have some biologists who fly in helicopters. We've got some teens who are CEOs of their own companies. We've got someone whose job it could be to fight a zombie epidemic. Fact. And uh, you may say, John, okay, that's fine. That's cool, but it's not exactly rocket science. Well, we have a rocket science here, scientist here today. So get excited. Um, each talk is going to be about three to six minutes, and we'll have time for some questions at the end. And uh, yeah, I can see about like 20 of you on your phones already. So uh, don't worry, we thought of you too. If that like chronic head condition that you have has stopped you from being able to lift your head and follow along, we have uh, an app that you can use called the Event Moby app. Just put it on your phone and you'll be able to interact. The code to get in is Canada 2067 Vancouver. Uh, we also have Wi-Fi. Uh, the hashtag is, uh, the uh, name of the network is hashtag TELUS and then follow the prompts to get in there. But while you're doing that, while you have your phones in your hand, just, just put them on silent. We really, really appreciate that up here. And the event is being live streamed. So hi to all our friends watching out there. Uh, I just, I'm just gonna check something. Oh. Yeah, there I am. <laughs> oh, it totally works. And I can tell you, looking at this screen, that watching it right now really feels like I'm actually in the room. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so, but maybe the biggest deal of all here is that this summit is an opportunity to change the future of science education. Uh, and science is important, science is everywhere. Take me for example, I'm a reporter, I'm a guy who goes out and interviews people, asks people questions, anywhere from the, the man on the street, or the person on the street, all the way up to the Prime Minister, I've been to various countries, I've been all over this country doing stuff, asking questions. That, from the outside, that looks like a very artsy job. It's a lot of words, it's a lot of conversations. But uh, when, I, when I started it, I, I qu very quickly realized that news and the stuff we talk about is, is what affects people. And that is very much rooted in the natural world. And you need science to understand that kind of stuff. Um, we're also using technology all the time. I've got to figure out uh, a, a lot of the broadcasting equipment that I use every day. But on top of that, we're using technology to tell stories. And if you asked me 10 years ago when I started that I would be coding as a regular part of my job as a journalist, I would have said that's impossible. But the fact is I do, I code. I'm, I am somebody who looks from the outside, it looks like an arts job, but in fact, it's very much uh, a STEM-related uh, field. And that, that is a surprise to me, and that's gonna happen more and more, and being able to code has opened up doors in my field that I would not have expected. So, so pay attention and take this opportunity and listen closely because, <coughs> excuse me, at the end of the job, or at the end, this is about what you can learn and what you can, uh, what you can contribute. And uh, you could think of it as the energy you get out of today's event is the same as the energy that you put in minus heat <laughs> because the other part of my job is making bad puns for headlines. So I'm really glad that joke in the science field got such a good reaction. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's get moving. First off, I'd like to introduce Coast Salish elder Roberta Price, who will begin our event with a traditional opening ceremony. Thanks very much, Roberta. Very, very honored to be here. Good morning and greetings to everyone and all of you who are watching on the live stream. 
have to share with you that when um, Julie asked me if uh, I would mind being lime streamed, I had to ask my granddaughter what that meant. I'm of the era that I don't go on Facebook, but I can do email and computer, but anyway, so I'm very, very pleased and honored to be here to share a welcome and a blessing for, for this beautiful, beautiful event today. So ceremony, ceremony guided each and every step of each and every day of our lives as taught to me by my elders. I have in my hand some cedar boughs as taught to me by my elders. We would pick those cedar boughs each and every morning. We would go into that cold, cold water. We would brush every part of our bodies off with their cedar boughs. What we are doing is a cleansing ceremony. We're pushing all the negative and evil energy off of us so we can go about our day in a good and respectful way. To share a little bit of the meaning of negative energy, I want to share with you that I've been going into classrooms now in the Lower Mainland for 31 years talking about the First Nations. I'll share the exercise with each and every one of you today that I share in teaching the little ones and big ones about negative energy. Folks, and you, you folks on live stream as well, raise your hand if you've ever had a cranky moment in your life. Yes, that, my dear friends, is the meaning of negative energy. Can you do things really well when you are cranky? Uh-uh. Maybe extra hard, extra fast, but not really well. So brushing all that negative energy off of you in that cleansing ceremony every day so you can go about your day in a good and respectful way. Part of the power of the sacred cedar boughs too, it kind of puts a protective force around you, constantly deflecting any negative energy that may come your way during the day. Other important ceremony is taught to me by my elders is the ceremony of introduction to share your name, your nation, your family. And if it isn't your traditional territory, as I share with those little ones, traditional territory is the place where you were born. If it isn't your traditional territory, to always respectfully ask permission to be on that territory. I share that with you now. Good morning, everyone. My name is Roberta Price. My heritage is I am Coast Salish. I am Snanemo on my dad's side, and that's where I was born. When they came to our lands, they couldn't say our names. They couldn't say our language. So perhaps when they couldn't say Snanemo, they called it Nanaimo. So I was born there right on the number one reserve, right on the waterfront in Nanaimo. And I am Cowichan on my mom's side. The dialect of the language of my people is taught to me by my elders on this side. The language of my people is called the Halkomilum language. I knew and understood and spoke my language fluently until I was six years old. Beyond six years old, I was not allowed to have anything to do with my language, my heritage, and my culture. I was actually tortured about that. I have spent well over 40 years reclaiming back my identity, searching out for my family, and especially searching for my mother. Very, very pleased and proud to finally find my mom when I became a grandmom in 1994. I was able to spend eight years with my mother before she passed away. My mother affirming all the teachings of all the elders. I felt they were stepping stones to meeting my mom. And I share with you that due to those horrific experiences from age six onwards, I used the contemporary Western method of healing, counseling in psychiatry and psychology. But I really felt the greatest part of my healing journey came. I call her a dear friend today. My dear friend Flo was my boss in the early 80s. My dear friend Flo spent her entire life in the residential school. My dear friend Flo was also helper to the elders. She knew what I needed. She brought me to those elders. Those elders, they took me under their wing. They taught me. They guided me. They prayed for me. But mostly importantly of all, what they did for me is they loved me. They loved me unconditionally. 
unconditionally. Because when you are ripped away from your family, age three, four, five, six, and older, what you are missing is that unconditional love you receive from your parents, your grandparents, your family, your nation, your community. That unconditional love. Never ever dream for one moment that close to 40 years later, I would be walking in those elders' footsteps today, sharing that same unconditional love with so many and so many communities. We still need it. We still need it very, very much. And I wish to share with you some of the teachings of some of those beautiful elders I work with. I had the blessing of working with up to close to elder, 30 elders in my journey. Really blessed to do that. We don't have that many elders today, but I felt really blessed. And some of those teachings of those elders, I want to share with each and every one of you today. And those of you who are on the live stream, I want you to participate with us as well in those teachings to honor and respect the Coast Salish territory and our elders and ancestors. I'll share the teaching first. Then what I'd like to do is call you each out of your comfort zone to join me in those teachings, to start the day off, to, to bless your time, to cover your hearts in that blessing. Two of the elders that I work with for many, many years out of those 30 elders. Elder Vince Stogan from the Musqueam, the Musqueam First Nations, which is right on the territory where the University of British Columbia stands in southern Vancouver. Elder Bob George, who is from the Slayway Tooth Nation on the North Shore, what they used to call the Burrard. I work with them many, many years. And their teachings and many other elders' teachings are that whenever we come together, we must share a blessing and a prayer to cover our hearts, to cover our interactions, cover our minds and our spirits. Elder Vince's teachings were that whenever we come together, we'd be in a circle. But you know what? I have another teaching elder, Elder Fred John, who is from the Statlium people, the Lilwat people. He says, you know what, Roberta? We can modernize things. We're very, very adaptable. So we'll just do that very thing today. We'll modernize it. Because Elder Vince and, and many other elders, Elder Bob, we would normally be in a circle. We would be standing in a circle in that blessing and prayer. But we can just do it where we are today. Elder Vince's teachings are that whenever we come together for the blessing, we join hands. And when we join those hands, what we do is we put our left palm up to our person on our left. That left palm up is to Father Sky. We put our right palm down to our person on our right. That right palm down is to Mother Earth. So we're keeping those connections. And his other teachings are that our left palm up is to the ancestors we're calling down and calling upon in the prayers to be amongst us as we work, play, interact. Our right palm down is to our children, all of you guys, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. When we join hands in that way, we're keeping those connections very, very strong. So I'm gonna call you each out of your comfort zone to take a stand, if you're able to stand. So please stand up and we'll join hands in that way. If you happen to be on an end, if your left palm is on the end, just put your left palm up in the air, just like Elder Roberta is gonna do. And your right palm, just put your right palm down. So our left palm is up and our right palm is down. And I want to share with you, when I first met my elders, very, very confused I was. Sometimes didn't know my right from my left. As my sister always says, your other right, Bert, your other right. So if we have our hands up like that, we'll share a blessing and a prayer. And especially for you folks, you students that are on the live stream, please feel free to join us in this blessing and a prayer for our beautiful event today. We're all ready. Haichka, Haichka Osiem, Osiem. We call upon you, Creator, to bring your many, many blessings down upon this very, very special event today. 
We ask, Creator, that you bless the ones who are away due to illness or other obligations. Bless the ones who may yet to arrive. Help them to arrive safely. We call upon you, Creator, to bring your blessings down upon our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our spirits. So when we think our thoughts, they are good, positive, and respectful. When we speak our words, they are good, positive, and respectful. We call upon you, Creator, to bless the people who prepared the food, delivered the food, bless the food and drink as we put it in to nourish our bodies on our journeys to wellness and strength. And we ask, Creator, that you bless all the shared teachings, all the shared learnings, all the shared experiences that will go on in our very, very special event today. And we ask, Creator, that you cover us each with your blanket of protection as we journey through our lives in education, our professional lives, our family lives, and our lives in general. And we give you many, many thanks, Creator, as we always ask you to bring all of your blessings down upon the hurting, the hungry, and the homeless and especially the hurting creator, Heichka, Heichka Osiem, Osiem. Thank you, everyone. You can sit down now, Heichka Siem. And I just want to share one more teaching before I take my seat. Thank you, John. In the Coast Salish territory, the Coast Salish Longhouse, when we want to say thank you and we give honor to people, you can copy me, folks. We put our palms up in the air just like this, right in front of us. So let's all put our palms up in the air. And those of you on live stream as well, put our palms up in the air and we say, and copy me too. We say, Heichka. <laughs> Beautiful. Sometimes I have to get people to say that maybe two or three times because we're a little bit shy when we don't know, you know how to say certain things. Want to honor someone, they've come to your territory, really want to honor them for what they've come to share, what they've come to give you. Put our palms up in the air again, and we say, Heichka Osiem. Beautiful, beautiful, everyone. I say Heichka Osiem to each and every one of you in your journey of learning today, and hope this day goes really wonderful, and each and every one of you travel back to your homes uh, and arrive there safely. So Heichka, Heichka Osiem, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, Roberta. Uh, please accept this token of our appreciation. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so this event here is organized by an organization called Let's, Let's Talk Science, and the head of that organization is Bonnie Schmidt. So let's talk about Bonnie. Let's talk about how, for the past more than 20 years, she's been using this organization as a platform to improve science education all across this country. Um, now let's let Bonnie talk about Let's Talk About Science. And let's listen. Thanks, John. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. But before I, I speak, I just want to thank Elder Roberta for your wonderful, wonderful comments. I, I'm getting my lessons here. Heichka. Heichka. Your, your, your wonderful words, I hope, will open our minds so today we can dig deep into the wisdom that each of us possesses and your words to open our hearts so that we can collaborate in a very kind and compassionate way. Together we can build and design a world that will be inclusive and, and good and innovative. So thank you, Heichke. <laughs> thank you. To everyone else, thank you so much for joining us today. As John said, I'm president and founder of Let's Talk Science, and it has been about 27 years that I've been uh, with the organization. Today is a really proud moment for me. It's the culmination of about a year and a half, almost two years of planning. Our goal with Canada 2067 is to work together as a country and have a new conversation about the importance of education and the role that science, technology, engineering, and math plays in each and every one of our futures. The date we chose for the initiative has significance. It not only is the bicentennial year for Canada, 2067, but we're hoping that it will be the time that you will begin to think about retirement. So it's not that far out. You are the leaders 
for Canada for the coming decades. And it's very important that you have an opportunity to, to plan what will come next. It's important for you to open your minds to the opportunity uh, that are being presented through the different STEM areas, especially as Canada is, is changing so rapidly. So our goal for today is to spend the morning with some amazing role models. You'll meet them soon. They will talk to you about the future, the future of opportunity that is open to you if you embrace it, not traditional views on, on STEM learning, and I think that you'll find that to be quite fun. And then this afternoon, we're going to hear from you about your goals for the future and how you can help us to build and design a system and an educational experience that will work for you and those that come after. So I do have a quick letter to read. Unfortunately, the Minister of Education was deeply wanting to be here, but the House is sitting and he couldn't, couldn't get here. So uh, the Honourable Rob Fleming, Minister of Education, did send a letter. So if you'll allow me, I'll just read that. So welcome to all of the students from Vancouver and Surrey and North Vancouver who are attending today. And thanks to Let's Talk Science for planning this exciting and inspiring Canada 2067 Vancouver Regional Youth Summit. I'm sorry I'm unable to be with you in person today, but I'm very pleased that the president of Let's Talk Science, Bonnie Schmidt, has agreed to share my words. Our new government is excited about events like today, especially because Vancouver has been chosen to host the first in a series of five youth summits being held across Canada. The summit provides amazing opportunities for BC students to join together to learn more about the fascinating world of science, technology, engineering, and math. It's also creating a, a cutting-edge national vision for STEM, and I'm thrilled that our students get to be a part of it. BC students are earning some of the best results in the world. A recent international study showed our grade 10 students perform second in science. These results come from the hard work of students, teachers, and the entire education system. We want to continue to build our student success, and that's why our government is making significant investments in education to make sure students are getting the support they need to thrive and also achieve their best. Congratulations to the organizers for creating such an inspiring event. Together we can work to make sure students like you can follow your passions and have the tools that you need to succeed in our rapidly changing world. Rob Fleming, Minister of Education. So thank you to the minister for his kind remarks. <laughs> and back to you. I hope you have a wonderful day today. We really are looking forward to hearing from you as today's events continue. So John, back to you. Thanks very much, Bonnie and uh, the minister. Uh, our next, or our first speaker uh, in the series is a real life scientist, and she plays one on television, including appearances on The Nature of Things. She is an assistant professor at the UBC School of Population and Public Health, where she studies diseases and outbreaks, and I know you will find her enthusiasm for her job infectious. Let's welcome Jennifer Gardy. <laughs> Thank you, John. That was a terrible pun. Um, so, Halloween is just around the corner. I'm going to start with a Halloween-y, spooky, scary sort of question for all of you. By show of hands, how many people here have given serious thought to what you would do in the event of a zombie outbreak? Hands up. Oh, yeah, pretty much everybody. John, too. Good. Well, my STEM career, my job, is all about making sure you never have to put your zombie escape plan into effect. My colleagues and I at the BC Center for Disease Control, we are the first line of defense between you and armies of the undead. So we work in public health. This is our office. We're just up by Vancouver General Hospital and by City Hall. And uh, public health is really all about keeping you, the public, wait for it, healthy. Um, I think you probably saw where that was going. Um, and BC CDC is a super cool place to work. If there were something like a zombie outbreak, we would be the first to know about it. Our surveillance systems would pick it up. We'd be the ones that would have to diagnose that outbreak. We'd have to potentially discover a totally new infectious agent. 
We'd be the ones who are responsible for controlling that outbreak, making sure it doesn't get any further, and we'd be the ones responsible for prevention, getting people vaccinated so that they don't turn into zombies either. And while zombies are obviously a figment of Hollywood's imagination, or at least we think, uh, the stuff that we do in a zombie outbreak, or we would do, is the same stuff that we do every day for more everyday routine pathogens. There's a lot of boring stuff out there, infectious diseases that uh, were around for a while and kind of making a comeback, things like measles, things like mumps. There's pretty standard everyday stuff, you know, food poisoning, flu, the common cold, but we also get some really cool pathogens too, things that maybe aren't as deadly and dramatic as a zombie outbreak, but I think are potentially just as dangerous. There's things like the Ebola virus, for example. Here's a picture of the Zika virus that's been going around in Brazil lately, something we've known about for 70 years, but all of a sudden started causing really weird, strange illnesses in people in a part of the world we hadn't seen before. We've got things like antibiotic-resistant superbugs, bacteria often transmitted in hospitals that are resistant to all of the medicines we have. This is probably a bigger threat to humanity right now than a zombie apocalypse. And we at the CDC are the ones who are tasked with studying all of this. There's loads of different jobs within that CDC building, but the one that I do, the one that I think is the most interesting, is trying to figure out how outbreaks of infectious disease start and how they spread from person to person. And to do this, I use a really cool technology. I use something called genome sequencing. A genome is simply the set of genetic instructions that encodes a living thing. Every living thing has a genome. Humans have a genome. You each have many, many, many copies of your genome in your body and almost every one of your cells. But all of the things that I like to study, the bacteria, the viruses, the parasites, the fungi, they all have genomes too. And by reading their genomes, literally reading them like a book, I I can figure out where did that pathogen come from and how is it spreading from person to person, information that is incredibly important for us if we want to be able to control that outbreak. Now, reading a genome sounds like something that is fairly complicated, and up until a couple of years ago, it was. The equipment that we'd use to read a genome was big stuff. It would be, say, the size of like a stove or an oven in your house, a pretty big box. But just in the last couple of years, the technology has changed dramatically. Here is a picture of Raymond. Uh, Raymond works with two friends of mine, and what he's doing here is sequencing Ebola virus genomes. He, when this picture was taken, was on the ground in the West African Ebola response. And he's sequencing the genomes on that tiny little rectangle that's plugged into the USB port of his computer. That's amazing, going in just a couple years from a box the size of a stove to this tiny USB-powered DNA sequencer. We can take genome sequencing, we can take DNA sequencing anywhere these days. We can take it into the heart of a jungle and do it right in the middle of an outbreak. The other thing that's cool about this picture like I said, Raymond is sequencing Ebola virus genomes. This is one of the deadliest pathogens known to man. But you notice he's not in a special lab. He's not wearing one of those blue positive pressure suits hooked up to an air hose. He's just at a desk in his office. This new type of sequencing technology means that we can sequence anywhere. We don't need that specialized lab. So a lot of my work is reading these pathogen genomes, and a lot of it doesn't take place in a lab. It takes place at a desk like this. So if you're somebody that's interested in public health as a career, if you want to do the same sort of stuff that I do for work, yes, it's important to study biology, and yes, it's important to study microbiology and health and medicine, but it's also important to be like the computer cat here and get really comfortable with data science, with using your computer to analyze massive, large, data sets. I do a load of computational biology, and it's pretty cool that that, that sitting there with a laptop and a tiny DNA sequencer in the middle of a jungle sequencing an outbreak is how we do public health these days. 
So, if you are somebody who is interested in solving mysteries, if you are somebody who is interested in keeping people healthy, and if you are somebody who secretly kind of hopes that maybe one day there is a zombie outbreak and you get to put your plan into action, public health could be the career for you, because if there's a zombie apocalypse, you'll be the first one to find out about it, and you'll be the one that's fighting it. So good luck, choose public health, and uh, if you're interested, I'll be around later and can answer all your questions about scary diseases. Have an awesome day. Thanks very much, Jennifer. I have a feeling that your switchboards at the CDC are going to light up at the end of the month. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. It's just good practice. <laughs> so uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, a company called Amgen. They're somebody that tries to stop outbreaks like Jennifer was talking about before they start. Uh, it's a company that's a biotech leader and one of the Canada 2067 founding partners. Uh, and uh, I don't see him, Jim, there he is, Jim Favreau. Let's bring him on up here. If his lab is anything to go by, you will find him highly cultured. <laughs> Thank you, and good morning. Good morning to you all. This is really an exciting day for you all. You're discovering new journeys and new pathways for yourselves in your STEM career. My name is Jim Favero, and I work at Amgen, and we're a leading biotechnology company. As a science-based company, we know firsthand the benefits of building knowledge, skills, and capabilities through science learning. I've been with Amgen since 2000. It's more like a university than it is working at a company. It's always about learning and learning new things and discovering new things, so it's such a cool place to work. As such, Amgen is committed to raising awareness of the value of science literacy and encouraging young Canadians like yourselves to study STEM disciplines, that's science, technology, engineering, math, in high school and beyond. Constant learning is so important. Did you know that seven out of every 10 top jobs in Canada requires a background in STEM? And that includes the skilled trades. Did you also know that half of the Canadian students don't graduate from high school with the science courses that they need to pursue a career in STEM courses? So you, you know, get your courses, stay in STEM while you're in high school. That's why Amgen is a founding partner of Canada 2067. And Bonnie, I thought that was really interesting that we're talking about their retirement. That's really thinking ahead. We are committed to helping develop a national action plan and vision for science learning for young Canadians, something that all of you who are here today will cont contribute to as you work through the workshops. Now myself, uh, personally I studied cell biology at the University of British Columbia, and I always talk to my son Scott, who's here with me today, and to my other son, Brett, um, about keeping doors open. I found with taking science courses, taking STEM courses, it leaves a lot of doors open and, and it left me the opportunity to work in one of the most fascinating industries in Canada, which is research-based pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries. I mean this sincerely. I've had the privilege to work in research-based organizations that makes discoveries of new medicines that can greatly improve a patient's life. I get to work every day with some of the most fascinating people making the most wonderful discoveries. And that's again because I've left doors open with my choice of STEM courses. These medicines that we discover, should you need them or your family needs them, we are so proud that we can make these new medicines available. So that's what's so exciting about the job that I do. So my choice was to go through in cell biology. For you today, you will discover your own pathway that you want to take and again, we encourage you to pursue your dreams in terms of STEM courses. Stay curious, ask a lot of questions. I say to my son, Scott, always ask a lot of questions. Don't be satisfied with an answer that doesn't satisfy you. Think differently, think out of the box. There's a short video that's coming up here, All Roads Leads to STEM, shows you some of the routes that you could take to activate your STEM journey. I'd like you to also encourage you to visit All Roads Lead to STEM Activation Pathway that's uh, in the building here to see which courses you should uh, look at to pursue your interest in STEM. Maybe you'll discover a pathway you didn't know about today. So today is really your opportunity to learn. Congratulations, you're all here. Have a wonderful day. Keep curious and stay in STEM courses. Thank you for the opportunity to be here.
Thanks very much, Amgen. I'm going to have to have a word with our technical folks about that. The ads for Science World there were supposed to be subliminal messaging, but weirdly, I still feel like buying a pass. Uh, all right, our next speaker is particularly interesting, and he's making waves studying physics at the subatomic level. He is the, also the executive director of Student Voice Initiative Canada and a member of the Global Shapers Network. He has made some quantum leaps working for UBC's particle accelerator at Triumph, even though he is still an undergraduate. So let's all get in an excited state for Rohan Nuttall. So often when I tell people that I study physics, their response is typically something like this. And I can't quite tell if that is fear, surprise, or constipation. Perhaps all three. You must be so smart, or wow, that must be so difficult, are typically the words that follow. And I can't quite figure out how to respond to these statements. I can't quite figure out why people are so impressed by what I study. So I decided to ask them why. And after some time, I realized that the people who felt this way seemed to see something in me that they didn't see in themselves. Perhaps they were never really good at physics in high school, or perhaps math didn't come naturally. Perhaps their parents weren't engineers or doctors, or science was never discussed at home. The funny thing about this to me is that physics was my lowest mark in high school. I also failed my first ever math exam at university. But now, I'm part of an international research collaboration in experimental particle physics. And this is where I work. And these are the, some of the equations that I work on. Achieving something like this is not just about the numbers. If smart just meant being, getting good grades all the time, I would never be here. I would also have never even considered studying physics. It's not just about the numbers. It's about how you think about them. It's about what you learn from them. It's about what they mean to you. A 40% on a math exam isn't just an F. I mean, it is an F, but it isn't just an F. It's an opportunity to figure out what went wrong and from there make steps to improve. For me, it was an openness to be curious and a willingness to try that made all the difference. And these were things that I learned from my parents and I learned from my teachers. And physics isn't just about numbers either. To me, the most exciting question, the most inspiring thing for me is the question, why are things the way they are? Why are some things radioactive? Why do magnets behave the way they do? Why is your room? Why does it get messy? But this doesn't just have to be about entropy or the laws of physics. It can be about anything, the education system. Why is it the way it is? Is it working for everyone? Can it be improved? These are the questions that physics helps us answer. And so while it offers a glimpse into the wonders of the universe, it also gets me thinking about the everyday issues that I care about and how to begin thinking about solving them. You start with the first thing you know, and you build up from there. And so now, as I'm in the last year of my university degree, and I'm thinking about you know, where next, I'm always reminded by this quote. Everything around you that you call life was made up by people who were no smarter than you, and that you can change it, and you can influence it. And that was by Steve Jobs. So when thinking about where next, with physics, literally anywhere. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. face when I say I've got a math degree people go what what are you doing asking me questions about news uh, so I know that feeling um, uh, coming up next uh, Kat Scott spends a lot of time in a chopper but this high-flying environmental consultant has dropped in to give us the dirt about work she does on land and as for water well let's just say after listening to her fish tales you're gonna be hooked welcome Kat Thank you, John. All right, show of hands. 
Who here has ever had a bug collection? Maybe, uh, which one do we go here? Ah, there we go. Uh, maybe watched a frog or a toad in a pond. Uh, kept a worm as a pet. Who here has walked through the forest or a park and wondered, what tree is that? Or what bird is singing that song? Awesome. All right, all of you with your hands up, look around. You, the world needs people like you. You are gonna change the world for the better. And guess what? Those hobbies and interests you already enjoy stem from the innate wonder and curiosity of the natural world around you. That drive and passion for the environment is gonna change the world for the better. And you can have a pretty cool job to brag about too. Common question when you get to be my age is, what do you do? This is hard to sum up in 50 words or less, but here I go. I'm an, envir I'm an environmental consultant and biologist. I work on projects related to fish, wildlife, vegetation, and species at risk. I build habitat and monitor construction. I work with First Nations, government, industry. I conduct field surveys, write reports, and provide professional opinions. Or I just tell people, I work with fishes and ditches. <laughs> what makes my job cool? Why should any of you want to be an environmental specialist? I travel. I see parts of the province and beyond that few have seen and many would pay to see. I get to ride in helicopters, float planes, and boats. Why is this not working? I went backwards. Here we go. I ride snowmobiles and ATVs. I get to honor that young me that, would, that loved to catch anything that moved. And now I get paid to do it. I snorkel, go fishing, bird watching, and bat surveying. I get to use gear that makes me look like a Ghostbuster <laughs> and play with cool technology like the echo touch meter for listening to bats at a frequency that humans can hear. Or the peeper camera for viewing baby birds in nest cavities. There are also some incredible women that have paved the way for the likes of me. And sometimes I get to collaborate and work with those women and that's a great honor. I've worked on several large habitat building projects where I've not only been a part of the design team, I have also been on the ground before, during, and after construction. I spent days saving fish, amphibians, small mammals, and even rare snails before construction began. I monitored the construction for environmental compliance, and at times I was knee deep or deeper in mud. I returned to the sites post-construction to ensure the habitat was working. The many challenges, both physically, emotionally, the long days, the blood, sweat, and tears, they were all worth it in the end when I could see juvenile salmon swimming in the habitat that we had built. That is an incredible feeling. So you might be wondering, what career can you have that's focused around the life sciences, such as biology, conservation, ecology, maybe even toxicology? There are many opportunities, and this is just a small example. You could become a naturalist or guide, work with First Nations, work for a nonprofit, conduct research, work in the private sector, become a consultant like me, work for government, or go into education. So how do I get there? Some careers simply require experience. Know what you do and know it well. Other careers may require hands-on training, such as you would get at a, te a technical school. Other careers may require a bachelor's degree or higher. Or like me, you may also have a combination of all three. Now that you've had a chance to learn about my industry, imagine the world in 2067. There are no environmental regulations, no one to ensure development and resource extraction occur sustainably, no one to help bring the balance back and to stand up for the environment, no one like me, and no one like those of you with your hands up earlier. There are no glaciers left. Sea levels have risen two feet. The Arctic Ocean is essentially ice free. The polar bears are gone. The ocean is acidic. Mass erosion has occurred. Weather patterns are extreme. And this is just climate change. Now picture British Columbia. Where are the salmon, the caribou, the bats, wood bison, badgers? What about our sensitive wetlands, forests, 
fragile grasslands, fresh water sources, all of these gone or at extreme risk. What water would we drink? What land could support our food crops? What fish could we catch? And what enjoyment could we even get out of the landscape anymore? This is extreme, but it is also a possibility. And all of these scenarios have already been set in motion. We are all to blame if we don't wake up and do something. The ball is rolling. It's up to you to stop it. We need to be responsible and develop sustainably. We need to view the future with a broader lens so that we leave the world a better place for future generations, not worse. Environmental specialists provide the checks and balances needed to slow the ball down. We ask the questions, provide the laws and guidelines, conduct research, provide advice, work as liaisons between stakeholders and government. As is, it's not a perfect system, but young bright minds like yours are needed to lead the way forward to a more sustainable future. Thank you so much. My hope is that some of you will want to save the future and consider the environmental field as a career. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks very much, Kat. Uh, when, when she put up that giant frog, uh, that, that uh, frog on the screen, I was actually watching the audience to see what you do. Most people would kind of shrink back in fear, but I saw a bunch of you go, oh yeah, that's cool. Giant frog, so use that instinct. That's going to help you out a lot. So our next, uh, our next speaker of sorts is uh, from another founding partner of Canada 2067. That, that's from 3M Manufacturing. They're a company that makes literally everything. OK, well, not actually everything. But they make a lot of stuff uh, from the post-it notes that you guys are going to be using a lot today to medical technology to, and this is true, I looked it up, a, uh, a product called the Bear Hugger. Uh, it's a blanket that's designed for patients with low core temperature. But that's enough of a warm up for 3M's video. <laughs> Take a look. Did you know you're never more than 10 feet away from 3M science? It's in our projects, our homes, our hospitals, our job sites, our cars, just about everywhere. From the smallest objects to the biggest objectives. But to us, it's not just about the products we make. We're a science company, working to improve lives everywhere, every day, and helping to put a bright and sustainable future for all of us within reach, especially for them. Here's uh, 3M Sheila Buttery. Hi everyone, how are you? So as John said, I'm, I'm Sheila Buttery. Um, I work at the lab in 3M Canada. It's a really exciting place to work. The team there is full of innovators and problem solvers, and I even brought an extra scientist with me today. This is Betty. <laughs> We're very excited to get to meet you today, and we're very excited to get to see your creativity in action. So I have an environmental sciences background. Um, I work in the lab at 3M, and it's a really exciting place. There are so many people that I work with that are such an inspiration and create really cool stuff. Today is really about the future of learning, the future of innovation, the future of discovery, it's all about you guys and where you're going to go. And it's things like this that we think about every day in 3M. We're really focused on improving the lives of all the people around us. We're trying to contribute to greater sustainability. And we're really trying to help our customers succeed. And that is why we recognize that STEM education is so critical to the future and meeting the challenges we're going to face. Canada's future is going to require as many workers as possible to be able to do critical thinking, make decisions, problem solve. That's basically a STEM education in action. 
But the research is really clear. Only about one in four high school students identify wanting to pursue a STEM career. And only about half will graduate with senior level STEM courses, the very courses you need to hold the door open to STEM careers and STEM opportunities in the future. STEM experts in the future are going to be in high demand and short supply. That's a niche that you guys can fill. I'm sure that you've been asked constantly since you were little, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's kind of a daunting question. I think the better question to ask is, do you want to do the things that matter? Do you want to put the ability to address really challenging problems into your own hands? If you want to protect the environment, like Kat, if you want to um, protect the vulnerable people in our society, if you want to create technology that's really cool and disrupts an industry or the entire world, that is what a STEM education can do for you. That is why 3M is here today and we want to support Canada 2067. They're a partner who is creating a shared vision for the future of STEM learning. We want to make sure that this conversation continues. So we have something really exciting for you guys today. You have the opportunity, if you look to my left here, to win a VR headset. What we want you to do is share about your day today. We want you to take pictures and share them with the hashtag CAN2067. So I'm going to kick us off. You're going to get to see my technical prowess at practice here. I'm going to start by taking a selfie with myself and all of you. All right? So thank you for being here today and adding your voices to this national conversation. And I can't wait to see the buzz that you create. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Sheila, for that inspiring talk. Uh, the VR headset, which uh, we worked that out earlier, right? Great, thanks. And also for the, every post-it note, each time I think of a new pun, boom, on it goes. Speaking of which, I am really over the moon about our next speaker. <laughs> Margarita Maranova has worked for NASA. She's a senior Mars development engineer at SpaceX in Los Angeles, where she studies extreme environments, which is obviously very handy for interplanetary travel. Uh, do not space out for this talk, because Margarita is going to rock it. I have to say, though, it's not the moon, it's Mars. <laughs> Over the moon. Over the moon. Um, welcome, everybody. Today, you're about to embark on your six-month journey to Mars. You have chosen to go to Mars to be the next batch of colonists to go and really make us into a multi-planetary species. You are engineers, scientists, teachers. You're going to build our new transportation systems there. You're going to grow new crops, make sure we have life support to survive. You have really decided to contribute to the world and make it a better place, to have, help us stretch our boundaries, make us think wider, and be more innovative. Um, and during the six month journey, you will continue to develop your skills, and then you'll really put them to the test as you get to Mars. My name is Margarita Marinova, and I am a planetary scientist, a rocket engineer, and an explorer. And my dream is to be able to build the infrastructure required for you to go to Mars as you become adults. Um, this is really what I'm working on, and it's not just a dream. We're really working on making it a reality. I was born in Bulgaria. That would be um, in Eastern Europe. And about at the age of four, my parents told me that they had met Yuri Gagarin, the first person who went to space. And I was really blown away by this concept. I mean, you sort of know what the world around you is. You see doctors, engineers, teachers, all those professions. But going to space and actually living there and surviving there, I, I really just got completely fascinated with space and trying to learn about it, trying to understand it, and dreaming about going to space. 
Um, when I was 10, we moved to Austria. And when I was 11, we moved to Toronto, where I spent middle school and high school. And through all this time, my passion really uh, continued for wanting to go to space. And when I was in Toronto, I became more interested in Mars. Uh, Mars is fascinating because it's another planet. It's sort of like the Earth, but it's also not like the Earth. It can really help us understand how the Earth formed, how the solar system formed, how life evolved on the Earth. And just the idea of setting up a colony there, of really thinking of a new way to live, to learn, um, everything you do would have to be reinvented. You can't just walk out the door without a spacesuit. You can't just assume that you're gonna find some berries in the forest that you can eat. You have to, you have to create all of this on your own. Um, and that's what really fascinated me. And with that idea in mind, that I really wanted to learn more about space and Mars and help get people to Mars, I studied aerospace engineering um, in Boston as my undergraduate degree. I worked in Germany on developing rocket engines. Then I moved to California where I got a PhD in planetary science and worked at NASA as a planetary scientist. Now I am a, a, a vehicle systems engineer at SpaceX developing the vehicle that will take us to Mars. And it may seem like I really was all over the place with my career so far, but Throughout, it has been driven by asking the question why, trying to understand the world around us and how it works, trying to build the, the systems and the technologies required to explore that world and explore the planets around us, and being an explorer at heart. Some of the things that I do as part of exploration and learning why or understanding why is going to Antarctica. Um, like Kat, I get to travel in helicopters, which is freaking awesome. <laughs> Um, this is the dry valleys of Antarctica, and it's probably, well not probably, it is the most Mars-like place that we have on Earth. It's very cold, it's very dry, it actually makes Toronto seem like a very warm place. Um, and so we go there in order to both understand this extreme environment on the Earth, but also compare it to what we see on Mars. We have, um, this is a weather station, might be a little hard to see. This is a weather station that I put up in Antarctica in order to measure what the conditions were there, help us with modeling what's actually happening and understanding the environment there. Um, the polygonal ground that you see over here, those weird shapes, we see that in Antarctica, but we also see it on Mars. And so by understanding how they form in Antarctica, we can figure out what kind of conditions must be present on Mars to also form these sort of features that we see there. I've also done work looking at stromatolites. Uh, stromatolites are a type of rock, carbonates, which really dominated the Earth for billions of years before multicellular life came around. And that's where we find the first signatures of life on Earth. Well, if we go on Mars and we're looking for life and we find a stromatolite, does that automatically mean that we have found life on Mars? And this project was focused on trying to understand what these signatures of life are. If we go to Mars, how would we know if we have found life or not? Um, an awesome part of this is that we got to use submarines to explore the bottom. We first did with scuba diving, but uh, you have limited bottom time with that. And so we went on to these submarines. They're single-person submersibles built by Nutco Research, actually in North Vancouver. And you can stay underwater for about six to eight hours with them as a maximum. Um, and also I had the privilege of working with Chris Hatfield um, on this project, which is super fun when you get to play submarine bumper cars with Chris Hatfield. <laughs> Uh, and Pavilion Lake is just a couple of hours northeast of here, so a place you can totally visit yourself. And now I work on actually building the rockets and the technologies required to take us to Mars. Uh, this is one of the rockets that we landed on a drone ship. So one of the things that SpaceX has been working very hard on is reducing the cost of, uh, sp of access to space. And to do that, we really need to make rockets reusable. If you launch a rocket and you throw it out every time you use it, uh, it's very, very expensive. And so I've worked on in the teams to figure out how to land these rockets, how to save them, and how to make the rockets reusable. Um, right now, I'm working on the Mars ship design, so actually building the ship to take us to Mars. Uh, this is the Falcon 9 rocket, and it's great for delivering payloads to Earth orbit and also taking smaller items to Mars. But in order to really have build up a colony on Mars and carry lots of cargo and people there, uh, we needed a much bigger rocket, which is what we're working on now. So my passion is exploration, 
asking the question why, and stretching our boundaries of technology. In my world, uh, that has meant learning science and engineering. But really, the bottom line of this all is following your passions and making a difference in the world. Um, it certainly has not always been easy, uh, but easy was never really my goal. My goal was to do something that I cared about and something that made a difference. And that by default will mean having those long nights, uh, working through hard projects, working through math and physics that uh, is not obvious to begin with, um, and really stretching your boundaries in your comfort zone. But that's, that's what's required to really stretch our boundaries as people and do things that we can't even imagine as we're sitting here today. So I challenge you to find what you are passionate about, what you care about, to be curious and courageous and make a difference in the world in the way that speaks to you. Um, science and engineering and knowing those will always help, but the most important thing is to be uh, passionate, innovative, and courageous. Thank you. Thanks very much, Margarita. Okay, so let's bring this event down to earth to somebody with some really strong roots in Vancouver. Valerie Song started her company when she was pretty green, but now Ava Technologies is shedding a lot of light on how to grow food in the dark. She puts the stems into STEM. Please welcome Valerie Song. All right, so uh, my name is Val, I'm the CEO at Ava, and today I was supposed to come here to talk to you guys all about why you should become an entrepreneur, but instead I'm gonna be a startup rebel and tell you why you shouldn't become an entrepreneur. Um, but a little bit before that, I'll tell you a bit about uh, my background and the uh, relationship to STEM. So I started my background in technology and marketing, and I've uh, sold everything from Microsoft laptops, um, I've researched bounty paper towels, uh, diapers, all these fun things. I've launched products like granola and cereal and bars, um, and I've even sold beer to restaurants, but I can't talk about that because a lot of you aren't 19 yet. Um, but after six months of working uh, out of school at my last job, I decided I would quit my job with no plans. I realized that there was a really huge part of me that was missing. I didn't really understand why I was working and why I was so passionate about beer. Beer is cool, but is it really what I care about and what I want to do for the rest of my life? Um, so I started entrepreneurship with no plans, no experience. And to quote Elon Musk, uh, being on an entrepreneur is like eating glass and staring into the abyss of death. Um, so one of the key lessons that I started to learn as an entrepreneur was it starts with why and really asking yourself, what is your purpose in life? What do you really care about? What do you want to change in the world? And that really um, extends into your business or your life or the way that you interact with others. And it really helps to speak as your brand as well. Two, failure is a good thing. And I was really surprised at this one because when you're working on corporate life, you know, once, once you make a mistake, your manager says, no, you're doing bad, like you, you're gonna get bad performance reviews. But what I learned in entrepreneurship is that failing fast and failing forward is really important, especially at the beginning. You save money, you get closer to your customers, you build a better product, and that's where you make the money. Uh, and three, being patient is key. Your idea will change. You're going to be told no a million times, but what's important is that you persevere. So we built Ava Byte, the smart garden uh, that helps you grow anything anywhere. We use 3D printing to prototype. We use robotic arms in our labs to test and play around with. Uh, and we use horticultural lights inspired by NASA and SpaceX um, to grow things uh, anywhere all year round without natural light. So. All in all, how do you know if you are fit to become an entrepreneur? It's tough, it's really tough. Sometimes life doesn't just give you lemons, it hits you with them in the face. Are you still prepared to make lemonade? Uh, one in 10 startups fail and only 1% of startups become unicorns. And the average life of a unicorn company, so a billion dollar valuation, is seven years, seven years. So if you're gonna get into entrepreneurship, you better love what you do or, or don't do it at all. And uh, Oh, it's stuck there, but uh, anyways, the last question I want you to leave is, is what would you be willing to spend seven years of your life or more doing? What is that thing? Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks very much, Valerie. I don't know, for all the talk about not being an entrepreneur, it looks like it's really growing on you. <laughs> okay, guys, it's time uh, to break some laws of motion because all the bodies in rest tend to stay at rest, but not right now. I want everybody to get up, okay? Get up and stretch. There we go. Okay, stretch. Oh, yeah. And now reach over to an, to an even seat right next to you. Okay. And now to the odd numbered seats. And now to the prime numbered seats. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. They're all prime seats. Uh -huh. All right. So, so for our little activity here to get us up and moving, I had, a, I had an idea that starts with the wave, but I think it's going to be a little different than that. We're going to throw a little sciencey spin on it. So uh, I want all of the young men in the audience to let's start a wave from this side and just sort of do this and go from over there. Yeah, here we go. And it's moving. It's moving. Oh, beautiful. You guys, you'll, you'll do fine in STEM, I tell you. And all the young women over here, I want you to start a wave and just start it there right now. And it's going this way. Okay, so the, the wave actually has one of the properties of an actual wave, which is that it will behave uh, in a way that allows it to do what's called constructive interference, where two waves come together and they double in their amplitude. So we can demonstrate this by starting the young women and the young men at the same time going this way, and we'll watch what happens, okay? So on three, you do exactly what you did before, but at the same time, one, two, three. Everyone see that? I saw it. You, you saw everybody in the middle. That's science in action, folks. Amazing. Um, OK, what's next here? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. OK, our next speaker does not need, yeah, you guys can sit down now. <laughs> sit down now. All right. So our next speaker does not need anyone to tell her to get with the program. Kelly Skaradoff has worked in the video game industry and as a developer for the company Salesforce. And she will compile all of these bits of wisdom into sound bites for a talk that needs no decoding. Monitor this one closely. Here's Kelly Skaradoff. Alrighty, so uh, hello everybody, I'm Kelly. Um, when the fine folks of Canada 2067 invited me here to speak, um, they shared with me some numbers, and I'm going to share those numbers with you. So as it turns out, less than 4% of students polled that were boys said they might be interested in computing, and less than 1% of girls. Really? So I took a look at those numbers and I said, well obviously, what's clear to me is you do not know how awesome software engineering is how amazing it can be. I always liked building things or making things or arts and crafts. And I discovered that software is like Lego, but with infinite bricks. Everything you need to bring an idea to life, to make something new, is there at your fingertips, literally, uh, anywhere you are in the world, pretty much. I mean, the only thing that stands between you and bringing a great idea to life is time. It's hard to say that about other fields. So. Writing code to make a computer do something for the first time was really exciting. I was like, ooh, it did something. Uh, having had the chance to write code that makes tens of thousands of computers around the world in our data centers jump up and do my bidding was incredible. It was like having my own robot army. Now, like all good robot armies, we need to know what it's doing. We need visibility. Uh, right now, I work on a team that does a large distributed, distributed data pipeline that brings in data from a bunch of sources around the world. That would be us data broker in the middle. The details are not important here. Um, and so, oops, apologies. So what do I really do? Well, billions of messages around the world are being emitted every day in our data centers, even millions a second. Uh, that's a lot of data, right? We have data about what our customers are seeing when they hit our website. Are things fast? Are things slow? Are they seeing errors? Are they not? Um, we need to know. We need things to light up red and green. We need to know what people are doing. So our team's software specifically is like a courier. 
we pick up packages or messages from around the world, and we bring them centrally for processing. And just like a courier, we care that our messages always get there, that they get there on time. Um, and believe it or not, that's where things get really tricky and really fun. So you might be thinking that sounds kind of complicated. It somewhat is, but writing code is not as complicated as you think. It's not that hard. If you can speak, you can probably write code. Like, take this example here. I ask mom, can I go out and play? She says, sure. I go play. Maybe she doesn't. So all right, for good measure, I'll ask dad. And then I don't even check what he says. It doesn't really matter, because who are we kidding? I'm going to go out and play anyway. And software has different languages. Some of them have funny names like C++ or Go or Python or Java. Is that a coffee? Who knows? But the important thing is that, like when you learn to write, you could probably print, and you could handwrite, and you could write uppercase and lowercase, maybe with big pens or small pens or some fancy calligraphy. Right? Sort of the, the way you write changes, but the fundamentals are the same, and you can definitely pick that up. So coding is not all that we do. You might think typing alone in the dark, really hacking away or something, is sort of a hacker image there. That is not true at all. Uh, we work in bright, engaging spaces. This is some of our office space. Right? Uh, we collaborate, we diagram, we brainstorm, we draw together, uh, we build things. So I work with people even more, probably, than I work with technology. Technology is also powerful. I mean, it impacts lives. For me, software I write, people depend on it to run their business for their livelihood. People put their trust in us to keep their data safe, their identities. And even more than that, we get the chance to run charities on our, on our platform with our software for free. Uh, as a tech person, I can use my skills to benefit a charity, to help them make connections with the people they need or make technology websites that they need. And we can straight up donate our time uh, to the organizations that really need it. Uh, this is our team at the food bank, for example. Um, what I love about the tech community is it has a big heart. We care about giving back. So speaking of how did I join the tech community, what was my journey? Well, did I always know I was going to be a software engineer? No. <laughs> like many of you, I did not know how awesome software engineering could be for me. So I started off taking three years of a biology major. Enjoyed failing my first math class also. Uh, but you know, it was really interesting. I could tell you how a frog's heart worked or what kind of lungs spiders have. But I also had friends that were engineers, and I saw them making robots. And I was like, why can't I make robots? Then I thought, why can't I make robots? So I did. Uh, I then moved into engineering, took four years, including internships, and graduated as a computer engineer. My thought to you would be, it is never too late to change your mind or just consider something new. So speaking of journeys, I recently went to the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing, an amazing event with 18,000 women in tech together in one place, and an amazing job fair. Um, interviewing on the spot, people were getting offers even in the same day. Right? The market for tech is hot. People are really interested in making those connections with you. It's a great time to be in the industry. Something that really stuck with me is someone was giving out temporary tattoos. And it said, computing is too important to be left to men. And I got that, and that's my arm. And I got that, and I said, yeah, you're totally right. It is you know, really important that we have more women in tech and better diversity. But then I thought about that just a little bit harder. right? Looking at you today, think about your day. right? How many times a day do you interact with technology? It's on your phone when you make a call in the morning. Maybe it's in your car. It's your watch. It's messaging your friends. It's booking an after school activity. right? Technology impacts your life. It is very much in your present, and it is even more present in your future. So what I put to you then, as sort of a closing thought, is computing is too important to be left to others. right? To less than 5% of us that say we're interested in computing. So ask some questions. Give it some consideration. Uh, definitely don't think it's not for you or that you can't do it. As a convert here, uh, I'd be happy to tell you that you can. Thank you very much. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what Kelly was saying. Coding 
is not just about logic, it's very dramatic, and it can also be dramatized. So we're going to go play a trailer of a show called Emerald Code, which is an STEM-friendly series uh, put on by the same people that made Murdoch Mysteries. And it follows a group of teens dealing with uh, uh, life events, but they use 3D printing, drones, sensors, gaming, and coding. So check it out. Guys, is anyone on? Hello. Simone, those are unreal. My best invention yet. Anyone? Lana? I'm appled up and on my way. The Mayfair Music Festival moved its submission deadline up by a month. Bevan? Hello, SOS here. Nobody's coming to my party because I missed a bug in my code. Who does that? Jackson? 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 Jackson reporting live here from the lockers. <laughs> I told student council this would be perfect. Project Candy Graham needs everyone on the ground. In three, two... I can't believe all this. I don't want to jump the gun, but we're getting an A plus at least. Uh-oh, guys. No! Ah! Oh, what did you do? Can I just say again, we have no time and no project. I can't just write we screwed up again. Okay, let's do it. Oh, thank you, thank you. Super fun. This is more than a hashtag. This is a movement. You can get through this. You guys are great. I couldn't do this without you. Okay, take that, iCarly. So, uh, okay, we're going to move on to our very final speaker today. This is Alex Gil Gillis. He has already ticked off a lot of items on his bucket list. He has met the Prime Minister, he is the CEO of his own company, and he's got a TV deal, well, at least a deal that was made on TV. And he's, all, he's got it all done by the age of 19. So, don't worry, you guys have a couple years. Here is Alex Gillis to tell you how to make it happen. Thank you so much. Through the next short, very short three minutes, I'm going to tell you how at age 15, I started my first company in a province-wide STEM movement. But first, let me start with a question. Do these two look like CEOs? They may look you know, slightly more pimply than some of you in the audience today. However, at age 15, that's what we were addressed as, as my childhood best friend, Aristides Miliot, and I took the stage at the Youth Entrepreneurship Summit in Atlantic Canada. We didn't think that we were CEOs. We thought we were just working on a big idea. Something we came up with at the ripe old age of 15, when we were in our grade 10 year, at something called the Hackathon, or Programming Competition. What we learned that day was that you don't have to wait to grab those titles. You don't have to be 50, let alone 20 years old, or even 19, what I am today, to become a CEO, an executive director, or the creator of your next big invention. At age 17, I was featured on Dragon's Den for the company that Aerosides and I created back in the day called Bitness. This was a great time to start spreading my message about youth entrepreneurship. The idea that you can take what you learn in school today in your physics, your chemistry, even your art classes and start solving real world problems. This was my message and it really matters that you get in front of the people who matter most. What's most important is that you believe in your vision. For me, youth entrepreneurship was something that was very important to me. However, it was very hard to find other friends who were interested in youth entrepreneurship and creating different products, technologies, inventions. And we couldn't go and call our friends you know, at the, the Emerald Code Kids or even call for the next Elon Musk uh, or Mark Zuckerberg. What we had to do was reach out to school boards in Atlantic Canada and ask them to come together and help us find the next students who are interested in things like technology, science, engineering, and math to come join us through monthly workshops that we created through an organization called Hoist. The uptake was incredible. We grew from 15 to 60 kids coming each month to our workshops in the first few months of operation, and we've inspired over 600 kids to date. Being my own self-driving motivator was something that I wanted to share with my community back in my hometown of Halifax, Nova Scotia. This was something that people looked greatly upon 
as I wasn't motivated by things like you know, trophies or medals, I was motivated by a core message to be able to share entrepreneurship, science, and technology with my friends and community abroad. This is what happened, or these, this is what can come when you, you know, post something like this, an artsy sort of Instagram photo, and someone really picks up on the message that you're sharing. It can lead to the Prime Minister picking up and channeling your energy and your positive uh, kind of motion through his social media channels to share your vision to the greater public audience of you know, Canada. This led to the greatest opportunity of all, being able to share my STEM story with Prime Minister Trudeau and how being back in grade 10, participating in a hackathon, using the skills I learned through piloting a computer science class in my high school really gave me the motivation to start pursuing a career in entrepreneurship and in the greater STEM fields. You never know where the opportunity of something like an Instagram comment might take you, but wherever it is, make sure it's great. I'm gonna leave you with a question or, so, or a message to take away. Always remember where you came from. For me, it was getting involved with the hackathon, teaming up, teaming up with my childhood best friend to build something bigger and better, a technology product that could start changing the lives of organizations around the world. It's important to always remember where you come from and I leave you with a question today. Where will opportunity take you? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alex. Yeah, and, and it's a great question, and science is about questions, and we have an opportunity for you guys to ask questions of our speakers who are all today. So I'd like to invite them all up to uh, the chairs today, and while they're, while they're getting there, I will give a shout out to all of the people who helped put this amazing event on today and the organizations that made it possible. Canada 2067 is presented by Let's Talk Science with founding partners Amgen Canada, the Trottier Family Foundation, Hill and Knowlton Strategies, and 3M Canada. National sponsorships include the governments of Canada and Ontario, Nelson Education, Samsung Canada, and Toyota. And thanks to the Vancouver event sponsors, BGC Engineering, Chevron, Genome BC, MyTax, Stem Cell Technologies and Best Buy. And of course, thanks to Science World for hosting us today, as well to the Institute Without Boundaries at George Brown College, Groundswell Projects for creating the workshops that we will do this afternoon. And thanks to the Vancouver School Board, Surrey Schools for getting us all to here today. And thanks to all of you for coming. So I'd like a big round of applause for all of that. Okay, so now on to our Q&A. Um, you may have already noticed that this mobile app allows opportunities for you to suggest questions, so I'll be reading that there. And I believe we also have mics set up. Where are they? Oh yeah, there they are. So find, your, find somebody with a mic uh, if you have a really good question and they will let you bring that out directly to us. Uh, so yeah, it's your turn to talk. So the first question that I have here is, uh, what hooked you on STEM? Anyone want to tackle that? Ooh, ah, all right, I have Marianne. Um, or Marguerite. I think for me, it started with just asking the question why, you know, when you're like three, four, five, and that's all you ask, and your parents eventually get a little annoyed sometimes. Uh, but I just couldn't stop. Once I started, I was just so fascinated by how the world worked and just digging into things and breaking a lot of things at home. Uh, but it worked out well in the end, so it's okay. <laughs> I saw a Dustin Hoffman movie, a really <laughs> terrible movie called Outbreak that came out when uh, I was about your age. Uh, if you stay up really late, it's usually on bad, crappy cable TV. Uh, and it was all about Dustin Hoffman being a CDC scientist and going off and like, you know, finding this monkey that was spreading hemorrhagic fever. And I was like, that's really cool. You get to kind of go out and solve this really cool mystery, but there's also like bloody hemorrhagic fever and monkeys and cool stuff. And I thought that's what I want to do. So don't take your career inspiration from a Dustin Hoffman movie unless it's Outbreak. You can ignore the rest of them and oh, yeah, stick the, with that. That movie's great because there's Cuba Gooding Jr. in that movie who you can get. do literally everything. He's like a scientist, but then yep. he goes on like fights fighter fights Yeah, there's helicopters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He shoots yeah. down a bunch of military planes. Uh -huh. That's what science can do. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to do later this afternoon when I get back to CDC. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to want to share something? Yeah, Kat. Yeah, when I was young, uh, like I said in my presentation, I wanted to catch anything that moved. Uh, I wanted to, to hold it and keep it and 
love it, and <laughs> which was probably pretty terrifying for my parents when we went to Australia, and I wanted to catch all the things that moved because most of them were poisonous and deadly. Um, but yeah, I just, I just always wanted to know what things were. I've got like stacks of field guides. I'm always flipping through them, like looking things up. Um, I wanted to be a vet for a really long time, and then I worked for a veterinarian and decided that wasn't what I wanted to do, and then I was hopelessly lost for a few years. Um, and yeah, got into conservation biology and uh, started finding my way from that point. Cool. I can't really see with all the lights, but I'm going to trust that there's some questions up there. Hi, everyone. Is there. my mic on? Yeah? Okay. Well, I'd first of all like to thank you all for coming and sharing your stories and passion with us. It means, to, it means a lot to us as youth. My question is for Margarita in particular, but as well as the other presenters. Are there any opportunities to volunteer with different organizations that will help us in our science and mathematic journeys? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually started doing co-ops um, I, when I was in high school. I worked at the University of Toronto in various labs. I did. I looked at diatoms, which are little like critters with glass shells around them. I worked in the aerospace department. I worked in the astronomy department. Um, and then afterwards, I did internships at NASA, at various companies. So I would say right away, go and like just bug people. And that's what I found to be most effective. I don't think I have ever applied to an actual job posting, ever, literally. Um, I have always found people that I thought were inspirational or interesting. And I would just email them and be like, hey, I want to work for you so badly. Um, and people really respond to that, right? Passion is such a huge part of you succeeding that if you show passion, and then also certainly if you can also back it up uh, with some knowledge, you can get really far. But I would say right away, I mean, even high school, you can easily get internships all over the place. And they're the best way to really understand what's happening out there and get a lot of great experience. Oh, anyone else want to tackle that as well? Yeah, Alex. Uh, th throughout kind of my time at high school, I found the concept of mentorship really powerful. Uh, finding someone through maybe your parents or through your teachers at school, someone who's already in the industry that you're passionate about, and trying to team up with them, even if it's for a coffee, maybe once every couple months, just to start asking them and you know poking them with questions about what is it like to be you know a rocket scientist? What is it like to work at 3M? Different questions like these, and then maybe that, that will lead to something like an internship or a co -op opportunity in the future. But at very least, you can just start hearing about their experience and uh, how that might impact your future kind of high school course choices or career decisions. Yeah, and, and sort of from my point of view, as somebody who, who does that, talks to young people about it, it's not an inconvenience. A lot of people are actually really happy to get questions asked about themselves. It's like an opportunity to talk. So, so they probably will be just as excited as you are if you reach out. It's a really good idea. Um, all right, one of the other ones that's coming in is uh, looking back at your journey, what advice would you give your teenage selves? <laughs> Do everything that you're interested in. Just because you're maybe interested in a STEM career doesn't mean you can pull, you can't pull in parts of your other life. All of us have things that we do outside of science, whether it's communication, I do a lot of TV work, whether it's music, whether it's art, photography, outdoor lifestyles, you can put all of that together. And if you follow all of your passions, you can end up collecting experiences in so many different domains that when you squish them all together, you become such a uniquely qualified person that you can almost create yourself your own job. That's what I sort of got to do at CDC, where I was somebody that really enjoyed studying genome sequencing, but I also liked infectious diseases. I also liked studying networks. I also liked doing information visualization. I put all that together, and I'm the only person that can really do my job. So do all the things. Like the meme says, just do all the things. What about in terms of the community that you build with STEM? I mean, it, it, sometimes you can, you can get a lot of negative feedback from people. You know, you get called a nerd or something like that. How do you handle something like that? How do you make that work for you? Yeah, um, agreed. I actually, my parents didn't know what aerospace engineering was. So in Bulgaria, there isn't really much of an aerospace industry. And so when I said I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, they're like, a what? How about a doctor? I was like, no, I don't want to do the doctor thing. I want to do the aerospace engineering thing. And Mars, too. And they're like, ah. Um, 
I would say if you're passionate about something, and this was, I think, said by everybody here, just stick with it. In the end, you know what's right for you. And if you see a path for you and what you want to do, just stick with it. And it, I mean, you, you certainly should take advice from people, but sometimes you also have to ignore people and do what you think is right. Okay, so I got one coming in from the live stream now, which is what are your STEM aspirations, which I'm gonna to take to mean, what is the biggest, coolest thing you wanna do in your field in STEM? If I could start, uh, we wanna send plants to space. <laughs> so the, yes, um, that's one of our long-term goals is um, kind of start with the home and uh, introducing gardening into everyone's homes, but eventually to grocery stores. So what if every grocery store could have uh, a new living produce aisle? What if homes could be their own food factories? And eventually, what if we could uh, grow things intergalactically? I think that's one of our big STEM goals. <laughs> Give peas a chance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Give peas a chance, yeah. <laughs> uh, anybody else up there on the mics? Uh, hey, uh, thanks a lot for being here and for us, for a lot of information. I just have a quick question. You, got, you guys have a lot of goals, and for every step of life, there's different goals, and you guys have achieved a lot of goals. Uh, I was just wondering what your future goals would be. I want to prevent the next pandemic. Um, we shouldn't have as many infectious disease outbreaks as we do. We shouldn't have had Ebola in 2014. We shouldn't have had Zika in 2016. We shouldn't have whatever the next flu pandemic is going to be, because there will be one. And that's what I want to do with my career. I want to take the work that I do and combine it with some other really cool stuff, like uh, in this new field that we call digital epidemiology. I want to stick all that stuff together and make it so that we can detect the next pandemic a lot sooner before it becomes a pandemic so we can actually stop it and maybe even get to a point where we could predict the next pandemic too with things like data science and artificial intelligence. Yeah, I think for, for me as well, when I look at sort of the issues that uh, the world is facing today, the one that stands out to me as being kind of the most significant is the energy problem. I mean, I think that it's crazy that we're still pumping CO2 in the atmosphere and we still, in many places, burn coal or we burn diesel um, to power uh, the lights. And so I think uh, nuclear fusion is one of the most exciting things uh, for me. And, and, and so kind of bringing the power of the stars down to Earth is, is something that I think would be pretty cool to spend the next couple of years on. Cool. Cat. Or, sorry. The other K. The other K. <laughs> uh, I think for me, I don't know if my goals are smaller or maybe not. Uh, I would like to take the seats that I have, the teams that I lead, and I would like to give that seat away to one of you or someone I could mentor. For every place that I go, there's so many more jobs to do. There's a lot to be done. So for me, I always try to find the next person, mentor them, help them, and then give that seat away. Right, STEM isn't about being competitive or coveting things for yourself. It's about making space for other people. So my goal is, as a leader and now a people manager as well is making sure that I'm making space for the people that I work with and for you. Um, so you get those chances for those next opportunities to grow into. Uh, we need everybody. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, another one coming in from the app is, who are your role models and your inspirations? Who's really kind of inspired you to get you on the path that you're on? Um, when I was in high school, especially, I went to every astronaut talk there was in Toronto. And I would be that person waiting until the very end, being like, can we talk for like 10 minutes? I want to pick your brain. Um, so I think I took my inspiration from a lot of people. Uh, and that's something I've tried to continue to do is learn little tidbits from everybody and take wisdom from every person. Um, I learned that people have very different backgrounds and that was really interesting to me and made me more confident in pursuing a wide range of interests. Um, but also just learning to really listen to people and take the little tidbits of wisdom that they have because everybody has wisdom. And, uh, and I remember seeing Chris Hatfield in your presentation, right? Do you, if anybody here follow him on Twitter? Yeah, I mean, he's a Canadian celebrity. He's an icon. F starting posting those photos from space. I think that's really cool. Anyone else want to weigh in? I think also yeah. the, the people who um, 
who, who really bring out your strengths as well. I mean, the question was asked earlier about you know, being a nerd. I think the, the people who you should really bring into your, into your life, into, into your circle, who are the people who um, want the best for you and, and, and who are interested in your passions uh, just because it's, it's you. And I think if you can bring those people in, um, only good things can come of it. Okay, anybody else up there on the mics? Hi, so thanks again for presenting. It was very informative. But my question is really for anybody. When were you confident that you wanted to pursue the careers that you were in? <laughs> Don't put your hands up. Just go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for me, it was when I was out in the field for my very first job. It was a volunteer job. I was in Colorado and Utah, and I had gone through school and wasn't you know, really sure if this was what I wanted to be doing, but I had a good idea about it. Uh, I tried and tried and tried to get um, some work and ended up in a, a volunteer position in the States monitoring peregrine falcons, and that was absolutely mind-blowing. Like I got to hike around, sit on cliffs, watch birds, go river rafting, and I was like, okay, yeah, no, this is it. This is what I want to keep doing, so that was it for me. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Perhaps the question is, how many times were you sure? <laughs> it's super funny, but people, I think there's a lot of pressure on people to be absolutely sure about something. And that is not true at all. When I was younger, I liked building tangible things that I could see. I built a loft bed for my dorm room even, or you know, I would build things that I could see. I thought I might build houses or something. I thought that was pretty cool. And turns out, I like building things no one can see. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and in between that, I even thought I would do hardware. I really liked hardware and electronics. I was like, yeah, this is perfect. I love it. And then I met someone who became, you know, my manager and talked me into software. And pretty soon I was working in the video game industry. I think people worry a lot about being sure and that they will be locked in by their choice with what they do now. And it's far from it. Um, there are so many options. It's just a question of like, how many exciting things would you like to do? And then do that. Yeah, that segues well into the next question, which is, you know, given that people are changing careers so much right now, if you had to stop doing what you're doing right now, uh, what would you pick, and how would you feel about moving? Amusement park rides. Do you say amusement park <laughs> rides? Yeah. Like physics and engineering for amusement park rides. Wouldn't that be awesome? Oh, okay, Design the coolest slides and the coolest roller coasters. Can you switch now? <laughs> I still have some time left. Okay, okay. I get to do something that's a little fun. Um, my husband, for years and years and years, he was a musician. And then when he got bored of riding in a bus across Canada a bunch of times, uh, he decided to start his own business. And he started a distillery. So he makes booze. Um, <laughs> and it is so fascinating because it's a little bit of microbiology, which is what I studied. Uh, you know, you have to turn sugars into alcohol, and friendly little microbes do that. And it's a lot of really cool science as well. Well, uh, there's really neat engineering that goes into building all the equipment that's used for distilling. And it's a little bit of cooking, too. It's a little bit of creativity. And then at the end, you get cocktails. Um, so everything's super fun. And so I get to play on the weekends and kind of help out as a chief scientific officer. So if uh, infectious diseases suddenly just dried up, if we cured everything, I would just head over there and distill all day and have fun making these weird, crazy magic potions. <laughs> That's my excuse all the time, too. It's science. Exactly. That's what we're doing. We're doing science. Uh, anyone else on the, on the mics? There's one. Um, thank you for sharing your time, experience, and knowledge with us. But I have a specific question for Katherine. Um, you spoke about um, how we can, like, the people who put our hands up can change, like, the future, you know, global warming and everything. But how can we, as, like, um, individuals do that? Like, how can we prevent that from happening? Awesome question, thank you. Uh, just the changes in everyday life. You can be a role model for your friends and your family. You can recycle, you can you know, carry a reusable cup, you can volunteer. There's Dream Keepers, there's uh, Wildlife Rescue, there's so many organizations uh, locally that you can get involved in. Um, you can go uh, join the Vancouver Avian Research Council and ban birds, which is super fun. Um, yeah, just being, 
being that role model for everybody else. And slowly it'll catch on. You know, you can talk about all the fun things that you're doing and maybe you're releasing juvenile salmon into a stream with the stream keepers. Maybe, yeah, you're out there helping save some wildlife that's been injured. And yeah, share those stories and connect and it'll, it'll spread like an infectious disease. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have time for one more question. Who wants to take the final question? I see one up there, I think. Um, hi, and thanks for coming. Um, I have a, what do you think is the most important thing that we can do for the environment out of interest? From my end, it'd be knowing or growing your own food. I think it's really important that you know um, what your food miles are, where things come from. Um, and I think, uh, so statistics say that, you know, one in three vegetables that you eat are likely gonna have pesticides in it. And a lot of people um, don't have uh, allergies to food. It's actually allergies to pesticides. So do you really know um, what you're eating, where it comes from? And, and that can also help reduce the carbon footprint that uh, you consume every day. I would say reduce your consumption. Um, we live in a society where you're always ta told to buy the latest things, to use a lot of things, but we, we don't need to. Um, and so as living beings, we're going to have some sort of impact on our, on our environment. You know, the beaver is a perfect example. They change their environment. That's what living organisms do. But minimizing that footprint to what you actually need and not just taking as much as you can possibly get, um, I think that's what matters a lot. Yeah, totally. Ecological footprint, if you look it up, it's, there's all sorts of formulas you can use if you want to get into the math of it. And you can calculate your own footprint and see what each of your individual choices add up to and how big your ecological footprint really is. So um, choosing local food, um, choosing to walk rather than drive, uh, all sorts of options really weigh into that, um, choosing, choosing uh, clean energy choices. To add on to that, I think there, there are things that you can do on an individual level, um, like the ones mentioned already. But I think in addition to that, you can also, and this is something that I think um, from, from Alex's talk about entrepreneurship, I mean, just you don't have to start a business or you don't have to, that, that shouldn't be, or it doesn't have to be the, the ask. But you, I mean, I think being entrepreneurial can go a long way. So if you see a cause that you really believe in, uh, I think rallying and putting in the time and effort, and it's going to take a lot of time and effort. I mean, the reason why we're kind of in this mess and haven't been able to get out of it is because it's a hard problem to fix. And I think I really like the analogy of a big ship. I mean, society is kind of like a big ship. And if you want to turn it, you can't just turn it on a dime because otherwise you risk sinking the ship. But if you, you have to turn it slowly and carefully. And I think every, every person has a role in, in turning it. And so I think the one thing to remember is that your voice can be very powerful. And, um, and just to speak what's on your mind and, and also follow through with the action. If you're inspired, then you should, you should take the steps to, um, to realize what your ambitions are. Totally. And that goes for every single person in this audience. Um, all right, I think that is it. So let's give our speakers a huge thank you for their fascinating insights. And thank you guys for being such a fascinating, or such a great audience. Also fascinating. Um, I hope you have as much fun as I did, and I think your future in STEM is going to be 